Let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here tonight to talk about what we believe in the church. Lord, there's a lot of material to go over tonight, so I pray that you would um, help us to find the right balance uh, of talking to this and explaining what we believe uh, in a very deep and complicated subject. Thank you for those who are here tonight. I pray we have a really good discussion. Please let me pray. Amen. Okay. Before we get too far into this, uh, we need to talk about the main topic is, is the end of time. We have four different doctrines. The one of the pieces of paper you have is four of our doctrines that all have to do with the end of time. The second coming of Christ, the millennium, the punishment of the wicked, and the new heavens of the new earth. So we're actually hitting four of them all in one shot. Um, but this, all four of these have to do with prophecy. And for those of you that's in the room that are less familiar with the Bible, there's two different kinds of prophecy. There's prophecy where God is telling us what he wants us to know. And then there's tell, God telling us about what's going to happen in the future. They're both God talking, so as long as God's talking, it's privacy, prophecy. All the time that God speaks to us is prophetic. A lot of the prophecy about the future has already come true. So when we read in the Old Testament, there is a ton of prophecies that took place, and then it happened. So they were made by someone, and hundreds of years later, they happened. We in particular have tons and tons and tons of prophecies that were prophesied about Jesus. And we can point to those. We've been going through Acts forever. And when we've been talking about Paul going from synagogue to synagogue, a lot of what he was doing is going to the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and showing how Jesus met those prophecies. How did he fulfill them? But we still have some prophecies left. We have some prophecies from the Bible that haven't happened. Or at least most of us haven't. There's argument, there's discussion, there's disagreement over whether some of these are things that happened or not. So what we're going to talk about today this isn't just what we believe, but I'm going to try to cover some of the major viewpoints of end times. Several different perspectives. Uh, as we go over that, though, I want you to, to kind of get a feel of what this discussion is like. I want you to imagine you're back in school and your instructor of one of your classes, your teacher, has tried to explain some really difficult assignment you're gonna have in the future. And so he's explained it. And then after class, all the kids are together arguing about what they thought the instructor said. Well, I think he meant this. No, I think he meant that. No, I think he meant the other thing. And you're arguing back and forth. When are we actually gonna find out what the instructor said? When he actually assigns the, the assignment and you all get it in front of you and start working out, then you're going to find out, oh, this is what he meant. To some extent, that's the way prophecy is about end times. We have some instructions. Um, and we can, we can do our very, very best to come to conclusions. But the truth of the matter is we're not really going to see what God has in mind until it gets here. When it happens is when we're really going to get a clear view of how it's all going to come together. That's certainly what happened with Jesus coming the first time. Nobody at all predicted that the, the way it was going to happen was the way Jesus did it. And yet Jesus met hundreds of prophets. But no one managed to put together what they said with what Jesus actually did. Likewise, uh, it is difficult to push these together what might exactly happen. Well, let's first read through. Uh, there's two handouts in the back of the back. We're going to read through our four, um, our four statements. Number one, the second coming of Christ. If you don't know some of these words, I promise you will by the end of the night. We're going to learn what these words mean. So don't freak out that you don't know what the words mean yet. We believe in the premillennial, eminent, and personal return of our Lord Jesus Christ to gather his people to himself. Imminent means any time now. So we believe as a church that Jesus could come tomorrow or now. 30 seconds from now. 
gone. Having this glorious hope and earnest expectation, we purify ourselves even as he is pure, so we may be ready to meet him when he comes. And then we've got some Bible verses, we're going to look at some of those. Then we've got this term called the millennium. A millennium is a thousand years. Literally. We believe in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up his millennial reign on this earth. Notice that that's a, both of those statements are relatively, well the first one isn't vague, the second one is more vague. Number three, the punishment of the wicked. We believe in the everlasting punishment of the wicked in the sense of eternal torment who willfully reject and despise the love of God manifested in the great sacrifice of his only son on the cross for their salvation. We believe that the devil and his angels and whoever is not found written in the book of life shall be consigned to everlasting punishment in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we believe in hell. We believe that people who die without Jesus Christ go to hell. We do not believe that they simply quit existing. We don't believe that somehow they're, they have a bad moment, but then it gets better. We don't believe in purgatory where you can work your way up. We believe in hell. And then the fourth one, new heavens and the new earth. We, according to his promise, look for new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Which, by the way, it was revolutionary to me as a Christian when I started, I, my initial thought as a kid of heaven was some sort of ethereal, otherworldly place. When I realized that God was wearing a new earth, that I'm going to spend eternity living on a planet, it totally revolutionized my thought of eternity. For the better. Definitely for the better. The idea that I'm going to live on a new earth. So, but we have some, some, uh, some topics that have come up in this. We have a word premillennial, then we have the word millennium. What do these things mean? Well, up on the board, and it might be really small for you, so the, one of the reasons I gave you a handout is in case you can't see this as well, it matches roughly what you have on your handout. But I'm going to try to explain to you when we talk about end times what some of the viewpoints are. So if we go back in time, after the Bible was written, after all the Bible was written, including Revelation, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Fact. Not up for dispute. Definitely out. That event, depending on your viewpoint of end times, may or may not be significant. For this model that we just talked about, not terribly so, just yet. Okay? Time goes on. So Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD, a thousand years, and, but at some point in the future, Jesus is going to come back. We call Jesus coming come back, we call that the rapture. Jesus, only what we mean by the rapture isn't that Jesus comes back all the way to the planet. We mean that he comes to the sky and pulls us up and we meet the sky and he goes back. So when we talk about the rapture in that sense, we do not mean the second coming of Christ. We mean that Christians are taken away from the earth. Our doctrinal statement does not state where the rapture and the second coming happen, so it leaves it open for interpretation. There are three different times that modern scholars predict this to much to be. Either before what we call the tribulation, in the middle of what we call the tribulation, or the end of the tribulation. For most of history, everybody assumed that when Jesus said he would come back, that that and the rapture would be the same day. But in modern times, within the last hundred years, those have gotten split. And we, many, many, many Christians, in fact, the most popular view in Christianity today is that they're not the same event. But that is a relatively new thought in the course of human history. So what is this tribulation thing, though? What does that mean? What are we talking about? To understand that, we're going to have to go to the book of Revelation. And I'm not going to pull up, we do not have time tonight for me 
to try to explain to you what Revelation means. This is that stuff. Revelation starts with some prophetic messages to some churches. After those prophetic things, that's the first three chapters, we get into the end time portion of Revelation. It starts in chapter 4, and it goes all the way to, what's our last chapter of Revelation? 22? Yeah, 22. We got, what, 18 chapters. If you haven't read Revelation, you really should. And if you read it for the first time, it's going to really be like, whoa, what is all this stuff? There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of things that you are not going to instantly understand. But there are some things that you should immediately understand from reading the Revelation even one time. One, you will learn that things are going to get really bad on the planet. Really, really bad. Two, we're going to win... Three, there's going to be heaven and hell, and it's going to be forever, and it matters. If you get that much out of it, you've got the most important bit. We look in chapter 5 of Revelation, starting with verse 1. This is uh, John. So this is John speaking. This is his revelation that he received from God. I'm going to pick up in chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw this is a vision he had, a very extensive, long vision that he wrote down after he had this vision. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look at it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. That's Jesus. Jesus has the right to open the book. And when he opens the book, things are going to get bad. Why was John weeping? that the book wouldn't be able to get opened if what comes out of the book is so terrible. Because after what Judge Garland said, somebody should That's the second part of it. What did she say? She said that because after the terrible part comes something really good. And if we don't get the terrible part done, we don't get to the good part. That's certainly true. There's another reason, though, why the saints, and I kind of skipped chapter 4, so when we talk about what we would call um, apocryphal, not apocryphal, uh, apocalyptic. apocalyptic, thank you, apocalyptic prophecy, that's a prophecy about the destruction of the world. Here's the root of it. The root of it is, is that the world is so depraved and evil and wrong that the only hope is for it to be totally obliterated. And that understanding was known by the saints of the Old Testament. That understanding was understood by the saints of the New Testament. When we truly understand how awful the world is, then we know that the only way for things to be right is for what is here to be utterly destroyed. That is a good thing for this depraved, ugly, massively disruptive, broken world to get wiped out. So that, as Eden said, we can have something to do. So in verse 6, and I saw between the throne of the four living creatures, the elders, a lamb standing as a slain as of Jesus, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, seven into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him and seven of the throne. And he had taken the book, the four living creatures, and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. He goes on to say, and as we keep reading, 
what, what he ends up describing is the absolute and total destruction of the world. And there's some interesting plots. There's a beast. There's an image of the beast. And there's, there's prophets that, that God sent. This time, though, is a seven-year time frame. And we call this time of all these bad things happening, we call that tribulation. And tribulation means really hard time. That's what tribulation means. So some people believe that the church, that God never intended the church to be punished for the sins of the world. And the reason that, that they believe that we're going to be taken out before the tribulation is because they believe that it isn't God's intention for us to have to suffer the punishment that the rest of the world deserves. And so instead of making the church, instead of making Christians suffer from that, he's going to take us away before those, that time period comes. There are a lot of passages that can take us through, and it's very complicated. But there's another viewpoint that says that the really bad stuff doesn't happen until three and a half years in. So for the first three and a half years, it's kind of bad, but it's a generalized bad. And then halfway through, something changes and it gets specifically catastrophically bad. Horribly, horribly, massively awful bad. And then where we're taking up is between those two things. Because we talked, there's, there's terms like the the more minor tribulation and the more major tribulation. Is there so, any scriptures to support that? Yes, and it gets quite complicated. I really need a couple, I really need like a month or, or more. I can't, I don't have enough time. And, and I don't have the same problem with that. Yeah, exactly. So things switch. There's a generalized ick, and then there's a really bad ick. And there's, depending on how you read some of the other passages, so the three terms are pre-trib, that means that we believe that you believe that you leave before it. Mid-trib, that would mean that you believe that you leave in the middle of it. And post-trib, that means that you believe that Christians have to live through the whole thing. We don't get any pass because, because that person would say, no, there's only one second coming of Christ. And if there's only one second of coming of Christ, we know it happens here. And we do know that. So if you believe that Jesus is only coming back once, he isn't coming back once to get people, they're coming back to judge, he's just coming back one time, then you have to put everybody here. So then the rapture happens after the tribulation. So if you hear the terms pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and you're like, what in the world does that mean? That's what it's referring to. Our doctrine does not specify one of those. So our church does not have an official stance that we believe in pre trip or post-trip. That's, that's not part of our doctrinal statement. We can talk about it, and I would love to do a series on it, but that actually isn't part of our doctrinal statement. Um, so I just want to help you understand that. Then, another interesting thing is that there's more than one judgment. So we, we talk as Christians all the time that there's going to be some judgment of, of how people did. Good and bad. You know? Well, there's more... Most Christians today believe that there is more than one judgment. There's a judgment that happens between the tribulation and the thousand years called the millennium. And that's a, that's a beautiful time... When the, we're still on the present earth, it hasn't been remade, but, but God sets up his kingdom and he meets all the promises he made to Israel and it's fantastic. But there's a judgment there, but then the final judgment of all people living and dead happens here. That is the most common Christian view today, is that there's two. Uh, let me give you um, an example of that. I should have been um, in Matthew when we're talking about the judgment in Matthew. It's in first. 
chapter 25. Chapter 25, starting in verse 31, you are probably familiar with this passage. The most prominent view in the church today, the worldwide church, is that Matthew 25, starting in verse 31, is a description of this judgment, the first one. The first judgment. Okay? That one reads, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Notice that it doesn't say the living and the dead in that description. It says he will gather all the nations. And he will put the ships on, sheep on his right and the goats on his left, and the king will say to those on his right, come to you who are blessed by my father, and here the king is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes into a passage we normally, many of us know very well. I was hungry and you and th he gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And then he, he concludes all of this. I'm going to skip to the end. Starting in chapter one, I, or chapter verse one, I saw an angel coming down from heaven with having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, which is the devil and Satan, which is bound him for a thousand years. No, that's a thousand years bound. That's the story of um, No, what we're looking for is Je uh, Revelation 20. Verse, you know, verse 7 is when they rebel. So that's where Satan is released. So Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations, which are the four corners of the earth. It mentions Gog and Magog, which are mentioned in the book of Ezekiel, which we'll talk about here in a second. But you will notice Gog and Magog are mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 8. And then in verse 10, and the devil who deceived was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the end of it. And then verse 11, and I saw a great white throne, and who sat upon it, whose presence of the earth, uh, earth and heaven, fled away, and no place was found again. And I saw the dead, the great 
great and small. So this, the previous one was the, the interpretation of the one from Matthew is that it's the living nations, and the interpretation of this one, I'm trying not to tell you dogmatically which way to believe. In verse 12, it specifically says he saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And another book was open, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged of the things that were written in the book according to their deeds. So, one way or the other, the time that the dead are judged is that one there listed in verse 20, or chapter 20, starting in verse 11. And that's our, that's our judgment. So, the most common view of how end times work in the world today is this one. This is not, if you look at the history of the church, this has been believed for a very short amount of time. This was not common for the, almost the entire history of the church. This was. Not this. For most of the history of the church, the, what was believed was a very, very different model. There are still people who believe the other model. It is just less common. But I do want to explain it so you understand how it works. Please, I don't have enough time and I, I'm not even inclined to argue for or against some of these viewpoints. I'm trying to help you understand where the viewpoints come from. Um, but I'm not inclined to be dogmatic about some of these prophecies about the far future. I'm inclined to have good discussions about them for them to encourage us and for us to know what, what we believe to the best of our ability. But I'm not inclined to have big arguments about this or make a big Here is the alternate view of this film for a very, very long time. Jerusalem sacked in 70 AD after seven years of tribulation already happened. So the first view of the church is that the tribulation already occurred. That when Jesus talked about you will encounter various trials, he was speaking to the near future. That Satan was bound at the end of that tribulation period. That that's happened. There are even some who believe that there was a rapture here. Most of them not. But there were a few that believed that there was a rapture here and the second coming would be later. Most of them believe that the rapture and the second coming was all stacked together at the end. But there are some. Um, probably the most famous person who believes this model with the rapture coming first is... He just died. R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul. So if, if you know your theologian, R.C. Sproul is a pretty famous guy. Uh, he believed in this. He believed that the rapture already happened. So... In this model, Satan was bound and we entered the millennium and we entered it with Satan bound. And so they would say that the reason that the, the church now doesn't seem as dramatic as the church of the Bible is because Satan's not around to harass us anymore. So they would say that there isn't demon possession anymore. Is that even possible? Satan and demons are bound right now. This view holds some very dramatically different thoughts about what's happening in the time period today. That's why they also believed that the sign gifts weren't necessary anymore. They thought that the whole situation was dramatically different because they believed that Satan was being bound for a thousand years. And this worked great in theory until we got to the year 1000. Nothing happened. Well, we can wait a while. We can wait till 1070, because it wasn't sacked until 70 AD. So we should wait till 1070. That date came and went. Nothing happened. Then they did some more fancy math and came up with later dates and pushed it back and pushed it back, and still nothing has happened. So the people who now believe in this have to believe in a metaphorical millennium. They cannot believe in a literal millennium. The, the time. The expiration date of that belief is well in the past. We're in the year 2018. It's long, long past the time when we can believe the 
that that's a literal thousand years and still hold to this view. But there are people who think that it's a, it's not a literal thousand years. The, the word millennium refers to a time period, not uh, as in the idea of a time period, not a literal amount of time. So there's people who believe today that we're in that time period. And that at some point, the church, most people who believe this believe that God is waiting for the church to achieve um, a state where every country has Christianity and that Christianity has become the dominant and overall world religion of the entire world. Oh. The Catholic Church espouses this, and this is why the Catholic Church sought to take over the world. It was to get Jesus to come back. Jesus couldn't come back until they took over the world. The church had to take over the world so Jesus could come back. It was dependent. So the Catholic ideal is this one today, and they are still, as a Catholic church, trying to get the world to be Christian so that Jesus can come back. So we, it helps us to understand some of the actions of different churches if we understand the mental framework that they're coming at it from. What are they trying to accomplish? What do they think is dependent? I don't believe that Jesus is waiting for me to do anything to come back. So that very much changes my perspective on how to do what we do. Does that make sense? Very much changes your, your objective. But there are some evangelical churches, not Catholic, who believe the same model, and they have a tendency universally to have that same viewpoint. The church has to achieve some level of success where God, and they, they take this whole, in the millennium, where it talks about God reigning, and they make it all very metaphorical, very spiritualized, and that, and that so God is reigning spiritually, and it's our job to get the world to match what God has intended it to be, kind of thinking, and until the world matches what it's supposed to be, we're not going to finish this phase. That kind of thinking. This is called a, an all-millennial view, that as in we're in the millennium now, we're living in it. Our, our doctrine statement would, would disagree with this. We wouldn't disagree with any of these. So we have flexibility, we have lots of flexibility here, even the different judgments and stuff. Our, our doctrine statement doesn't dogmatically say you have to believe in three judgments. It doesn't believe in a pre, mid, or post. It just states some basic statements. But our doctrinal statement would disagree with this model. You couldn't do this model with our doctrinal statement. Does that make sense? I know some of this is it's harder topics. On your, um, on your little chart that I made, you should be able to see some of these. The first premillennial view, that means that the idea that um, Jesus comes back before the millennium, okay? So that was held by a small minority of Christians over the last thousands of years, we go back. And the people who did had this historic premillennial view, and then it looked like that. There was the church age, then the tribulation. Jesus came back at the end of the tribulation, People were raptured, Jesus came back, there was judgment, the millennium, we have the earth. Our modern view is on the bottom, and it differs in that the modern view tends to have Jesus rapturing the church before the tribulation and coming back as a warrior at the end of the tribulation. So it differs from the historic view. And then you see the amillennial view in red there, where we're in the church age, which is like a millennium. Jesus will come back, and then we'll have that. Then the post-millennial view, which I didn't cover much, is that the church age, the church is ever expanding, no longer the golden age of the church reigning, and then Jesus will come back even after that. Which is very difficult to explain, but that's yet another. Then, then, there's, then there's arguments as to whether or not we're in the church age or the golden age. So then, then there's some people who would say in that post-millennial view, the light blue. There are some groups who would say, until we, until we reach the entire world for Christ, the 
then we can't start the golden age. And when we start the golden age, then Christ will actually be able to reign on the earth, and then we get to do that for a thousand years, and then it's the end. Um, the post-millennial view is very difficult for me to line up with any of the scriptures timeline, as far as sequence. Uh, some of the other ones I can make work with the sequence. That one I have a hard time getting the sequence that I got. Um, that would be uh, John Piper's position, wouldn't it? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's surprising. He'd be the most famous, I think. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah, in many ways, John Piper is one of the people that I use as an example. Because he's a conservative who believes in the scientists. So he's one of the few conservative people that I have as a good example for what I do here. Uh, but in that particular case, I would disagree with him. Um, yeah, that's just really so it's very interesting. He's, he's highly esteemed mm. by a lot of people. Yeah. But um, like I say, it's sort of hard to line up scriptures with that view. Sort of, sort of it like, seems to me to be difficult to find a sequence that, that matches that up. Um, and if we had a month, that's, we'd be doing some of that. We'd be breaking down. Here's an event, here's an event, how do we see it in order? Can we, can we look at the Bible at these prophecies and assume that there's an order? You know, some people would say, well, not all the prophecies of Jesus were in order. But when they're laid out like this, where it's kind of a story, then to take it out of sequence and reorganize seems to, to stretch too far. It's one thing to take a bull or a, a monster and say it means something else. It's another thing to take the arc of events and, and decide we can scramble them. To me, those are two different levels of interpret of method of interpretation. Um, it's pretty hard to look at the world and think that thousand years can happen as well because um, it has been a thing in thousand years of peace for Christians and no persecution or either that. Either that's Man driven, which we got a drop of time. Yeah, I had to be man, and then just I'm trying to always expect to be driven. Satan down, lost base. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of writing up here. I know there is. Does anyone, does everyone get what we mean now by pre tribulation, post tribulation, mid tribulation? So that's the idea of when the rapture happens. That's different than pre-millennial, post-millennial. Oh, so we got these two phrases. We got something in regards to the tribulation, that's the bad stuff. And then we have views in regards to that thousand years of peace. And we got some big words that go with both. It can be very confusing. I like to tell people that I'm a pan-millennialist. They're like, I've never heard of that before. I said, I believe we'll pan out in the end. Um, anyway, so having said that, if we're, if we're kind of understanding what's going on with these, let's look at some of the scriptures that we actually have to read and, and go through those and see what we get some of our stuff. Um, unless, do we have any questions about the model like there's wasps? I'm sure it's not wasps. Um, let's look at some of the, of the passages. I'm not going to look through all these. There's just way too many. But um, let's look at some in particular. Second coming of Christ. Let's look at the first one. John 14, 1 through 3. John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. So if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Does that sound threatening? No. What's the what's the what's the attitude of that passage? Encouraging, comforting, positive. 
And it should be. Don't let your heart be troubled. I have a plan. I have a plan for you to have a good eternal future. I'm going to lead. I'm leading to do something good. I heard a, I think it was the words of a song, but really hit me big. Jesus created the world. I don't know if you, I think I've talked about that, but you, you may not know. It's actually Jesus that created the world. God created the world. He created the current planet in how many days? Six. Six. How long has he been working on the new one? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? He built this one in six days. He's been working on the new one for thousands of years. It's going to be awesome. The best thing out of that one is Jesus is actually saying, relax, I've got it under control. You don't yeah. need to worry about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, some people would look at that verse and say that that's referring to the rapture. You know, we're talking about the rapture being when people leave the planet. So if you would separate the rapture and the second coming, then you would associate that verse with the rapture. That I'm taking you away and taking you a good place. Okay? Can you separate those two things out? Um, we'll look at another one. 1 Thessalonians 4. So they would say that those people in this, they go up to be with the Lord, but they haven't entered the new heaven and the new earth because they're not there yet. So, so they would have to wait until this judgment, and that's when the books are read and the final judgment is made. That would be the, that would be the interpretation using that model. Trying to be very neutral in my mind. I'm just trying to explain the defenses of the various models. We'll do one more if we've got time. How about um, James 5? James 5, 7 and 8. This has to do with where we're living right now, because it's been a long time. Jesus left a long time ago, and we're still waiting. James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late break. You too be patient, strengthen your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So these are the kinds of verses that we use to talk about the rapture, um, Christ coming to the church, and us leaving. Um, the millennium, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, before I talk about that, one of the passages that is not in our church doctrine paper, I'll give you a copy. Um, Ezekiel, the end of Ezekiel, the last ten chapters. I believe is a description of the millennium. All ten chapters. I think uh, actually 38 
uh, I remember I mentioned Gog and Magog in Revelation. Gog and Magog, interestingly enough, are difficult to find on a map, even an ancient map. But if you go back to Ezekiel, it describes the war with Gog and Magog. And it does that in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 describes a war with Gog and Magog, which are mentioned in Revelation as this big war with Gog and Magog. They're symbolic, I believe. And after that, there are nine chapters describing the most amazing physical location you could ever imagine. I believe that's a description not of the new earth, but of the millennial kingdom and how it's going to be worked out. Part of the reason I believe that, just if you ever go there and read it, um, God promised Abraham some specific things about what his family would get, land, territory, and things. Those promises have never been literally met yet. The, of, the, the territory that God promised Abraham extends from Mesopotamia all the way to, to Egypt. Israel has never owned that territory. They've never owned all of it. They've owned it this much. So there's a belief, and it's a pretty solidly founded belief, because when you read in Ezekiel, what we learn in Ezekiel is, guess what Israel gets? All of the territory that God did promise them. It means they get it on this earth. And the time that they get to have it is in the millennium. Because they never were righteous, they never obeyed God enough to get it in this time period. They, they blew it during Joshua, they blew it during Judges, they blew it in the time period after that, they blew it, they blew it, and um, that's one view of what will happen in the millennium. But if you read the end of Ezekiel, it's a very interesting story. Um, well, let's look at some of the millennial passages. Let's start in Revelation, though. We'll start in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. Revelation 20, 1 through 10. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss of the great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And threw him into the abyss, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he should not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, because of the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast were his image. They had not received the mark on their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. So that's where we get the idea that the judgment, the big judgment, is at the end of the millennium. Verse 5. Because the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection is at the beginning of the thousand years, these saints that are going to reign, and the second resurrection will be at the end of the thousand years. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection over those of the second death has no power. So they will be priests of God and Christ who will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison will come out to deceive the nations who are from the four corners of the earth, God and the God, to gather them together for the war. And the number of them was like the sand of the seashore. And it came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and burned over the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be there forever and ever. Amen. And that's the description of the millennial kingdom. And the description of that time period from Revelation. And the description of some of this idea that people are resurrected here, people are resurrected there, and they're not the same group, and what's happening here. This judgment is considered to be of the people who survived the tribulation. So they lived through this. They made it alive, which is going to be like a small flesh of the earth. So those people who are alive have to be judged. So those people who are alive are judged alive. And those who are righteous get to enter the millennium 
as regular human beings, able to have kids. And those who are judged to, to have failed will go and have their, they'll go to hell now. And then the, the saints are resurrected to reign during that thousand years, and then they get to this point, and then there's the big judgment for all the dead. That's the way. Let's look at Daniel 7.22. I know we're flipping around a lot. Also, also in verse 21, I kept looking. That horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came. So that's talking about the second coming of Christ, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints at the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So, um, our doctrine statement would say that that is a description of the beginning of the millennium. Um, there are several other passages there, if you want to look at them about the millennium, I'm not going to go through them, we don't have enough time. Uh, punishment of the wicked, we've already read a few of these already, so I'm not going to read them again. Uh, but we've read several, we read the Matthew 25 passage, and we read the Revelation passage. And as we look at a new heavens and new earth, let's look at that, let's look at 2 Peter 3.13. This reads this, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then if we go to Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we have a description, a very fairly detailed one, of a new earth that God makes. Starting in Revelation 21 verse 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And then it goes on in great detail to explain the city that descends onto the earth, three main, from the sky. The point of all of these is hope. The point of all of these is that the earth has an expiration date, and at the end of it, all of the wrongs get righted. God's wrath, God's wrath to Christians has been paid for on the cross. But God's wrath against the earth, against the sin of the earth, against the, the ugliness of the earth still has a moment, I think, that, that we see in the bowls and the seals and in the tribulation period. God is pouring out his wrath on the earth. However that means, whether it's a culmination of the, of the curse, and, and when we start talking theologically about unlimited atonement or full atonement, that gets complicated. Um, but at some point, God is going to pour out his wrath. And that's what this tribulation is part of. It's not going to be pretty. Um, I'm going to tell you what I do with my family. I am praying and hopeful that we get to leave before it starts. I am preparing us to have to live through it. Does that make sense? Are you a prepper? Okay. <laughs> I'm a what? Are you a prepper? A prepper? No, I'm not a prepper. I don't, I don't mean prepping in that sense. I've got food stored up and I've got a little bump. At least six that. years worth, right? I don't have, I don't have heavy weapons underneath the house. No boxes of ammo underneath my bed. So when I say preparing, I don't mean that level of preparing. Yeah, I mean, 
I want to be spiritually prepared because what God asked me to do is if I have, if I've got this wrong, and you don't get raptured until after the tribulation, I don't want to be unprepared to handle that if that's what I have to do. But I sure do hope it comes to the end. I really don't want to be here when God is shedding his wrath on the planet and people are dying and there's disease and there's war and there's plagues. I really don't want my kids to have to listen to that. So I'm really hopeful that it's this, and I'm trying to make sure I'm spiritually ready for that. And if that sounds like I'm being wishy-washy, I'm just telling you that this is prophecy, and it's hard. And I'd rather be ready, at least emotionally, spiritually ready. I'm not a prepper. I don't have a bunker. But was spiritually prepared because that's what I've got to do. To be honest, if we do have a tribulation, I don't think a bumpy is going to help. It's going to be what it is. And I think there's a lot of deception in that time as well, like where, where the Christians will be. Because otherwise, it seems from the outside obvious that why would you become a Christian if you say, Stuff happened, but it's set the time and they I think mean, they're probably even more challenging and yeah. wise to be spiritual spiritual yeah. And look, and some of the things that we've talked about in past Bible studies, we've talked about secular humanism, we've talked about New Age, we've talked about some of the up and coming powerful religious humanistic. And you know what they have in common, we talked about it then if you weren't here. They all have in common one world control, one world government. One world religion. Secular humanism, what is their church? Their church is the school system. The church of secular humanism is the university, the college, and the high school. And they preach their doctrine through science books that are slanted to their perspective. I'm not telling you that all science is humanist, but I'm telling you that humanists use science as their doctrine. And they skew it in their favor to try to make it sound intelligent. So that you're an idiot if you don't believe what they believe. At the same time, the people who are the New Agers, they totally believe in spirituality. But they also believe in a single world government and a single world, world religion. And they will work together. And so as we see New Age becoming the, the accepted spiritual form, why? Because it allows you to pick whatever you want. Because it allows morality to be personalized. Because it allows you to pick your own religion, pick your own morals, and decide what's right and wrong for you. That's the most popular view of morality in today. So for those who want to be spiritual, there's that. For those who want to reject God, there's that. And it is all, in the end, one side. And when we talk about tribulation, what happens to the world during that time is that the world comes under one government and that there's one world religion and that it's a false religion. You want to know what I think the precursors of that are? I think it's secular humanism and New Age thinking. I do not think it's the Catholic Church, which is a very popular Christian view, but I don't think it's God. I think the Catholic Church has been on the downhill for a long time, and they're getting weakened by the generation. I don't see them having a resurgence where the whole world has turned to Catholic. They're, they're losing power by the generation. Um, so. Those are some of my personal thoughts on the issue. Um, but you should know that ultimately, we believe in the second coming of Christ. We believe in the millennium. We believe in hell. We believe in new heavens and new earth. And a lot of this, as a church, we say, you've got room. We have room to breathe. We have room to disagree. We have room to talk about it. It is not that specific. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions? All right. How many of you would want to do a revelation or in times class? Yeah. Well, I think so. Maybe. I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of things I would rather you ask me to do than that. Not because it is an interesting step, but it's hard. And that is not, that means lots and lots of hours of me going through this stuff and trying to make it. You don't have anything better to do, do you? 
Pardon? You don't have anything better to do, do you? No, never. Yeah. Never have anything better to do. <laughs> Um, but if it's important to us as a church to get into some of these in much more detail than we were able to do tonight, I'm willing. We just, I didn't have time. How about people accomplish that much? Pardon? How about people accomplish that much? Because of the work, the, you know, it's not really individuals to work out, you know, what their deal is with that time frame and then it's sort of, if it's just two minutes there, then it's pretty much. Pretty strong yeah. 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 And I'm, it's not, as I started with, this is not one of my best things. I'm not that interested in it. Yeah. It is, it's a very interesting question, and uh, if you've ever heard the terms um, covenant theology versus dispensationalism, anyone ever hear those terms? Some of you were like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, but um, those, those issues come into play very strongly in answering that question. Um, what, because we have to, then the, the covenant theology camp believes that symbolically the church gets all the blessings of Israel and God does not have to literally fulfill the promises to Israel because he's going to figuratively fulfill them in the church. And so God's under no obligation to actually literally fulfill all the promises of the prophets. And that makes it very easy to, to come up with whatever option you want, any option at all. Almost. If you believe that God is going to literally fulfill all of his promises in the prophets, then we have to start looking at the time period much more closely about how they're going to interact and what's going to happen. Um, I believe that a large amount of Jewish people are going to realize that Jesus is the Christ during the tribulation. I believe that while there will be obviously exceptions, I would even go so far as to say I think that through the prophets that are promised that the majority of the Jewish nation will accept Jesus as the Messiah. That is, that is an opinion that I cannot defend solidly. I'm just telling you the impression I get. I look at the Spanish and you know, I look at it, I, I lean in that direction. And I, I would say, in my view, that the time period where God's going to fulfill most of his promises literally is going to be during that thousand years. But that's when these promises of what God is going to do for the Jewish nation have never come true in our time period. And certainly during the, the tribulation, there's going to be some good times for the Jewish nation, but it's going to get very, very bad for them. So that second half, they're not going to, they're going to be as persecuted as anybody is going to be for them. So it's, it's difficult to, to imagine that this is when the Jewish nation is going to get all the promises there. It's going to be pretty ugly. Maybe in the first half, as a run up. But it was a difficult question. Um, any other comments or thoughts? Okay. Well, let's pray then. Heavenly Father, um, deep subject, difficult to make accessible to everybody. Um, and I'm glad, Lord, that, that as I looked at our doctrine statement, that it gave us some room to breathe. Lord, though, would you make us mindful of the fact that there is an end? Would you make us mindful of the fact that you're coming again? Would you make us mindful of the fact that you can come at any moment? Would you allow us to start changing our priorities of our life to match the fact that we know that eternity is a long, long time. And today, it is really brief. Then I should be making decisions about what I'm investing in and what's important and, and what I want to do and who I want to be with and what I want to spend my time in, not based on what feels good for the next half hour, but on the basis of knowing that there's an eternity that I'm investing in that eternity. 
Lord, we do thank you, thank you that there's a plan. And Lord, I thank you that when it happens, it's going to be clear how you're meeting every single promise. Because that's what you did with Jesus when he came the first time. He came and it became totally clear. Wow, we never imagined it would happen that way. But now that it's happened, we can see how it moves every single way. And Lord, we have every confidence that the next time Jesus comes back, it's going to be exactly as neatly, as tightly, as perfectly, as, as choreographed as the first time. And Lord, we look forward to seeing your might and your glory and your sovereignty as you take history and bend it to your will. Because you are sovereign. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.